we get started, I'd kind of like to know a little bit about you and why you're here. So what I'd like to do before we get started is get a sense of um, who is in the room, like what you do. Do you have enough? Do you guys have enough? Okay. Um, to make just to sort of understand who's here. Um, and so if you could say like um, a first name, I won't memorize all your first names, but I still like that. Um, first name, um, you know, what you do, um, and maybe something briefly about why you're here. Like why, now that you've listened to me babble on for an hour, why are you putting in another two hours? All right, would you like to start? Sure. Um, my name is Maria Ayala. I am a marriage and family therapist registered intern, currently working at a private practice. Um, the reason why I particularly picked um, this workshop was actually because of what you mentioned in the presentation about this being one of the most difficult things mm -hmm. to change, and that's mm -hmm. something that I've noticed with a lot of my clients, especially female clients. Um, it, it just kind of feels like no matter what, how we talk about it, how we present mm -hmm. it, how we process, um, it's like they, they get it, but the shift isn't mm -hmm. happening. Got it. Um, so just anything that I Sure. And one thing just to reassure any of you who are in like your boat, like let's just realize what we're up against. We're up against multi-billion dollar corporations that make bucket loads of money off people's misery. Like there are no multi-billion dollar corporations going, let's make people panic. Like, you know, but they are, you know, trying to make people hate their bodies so they can sell them stuff. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we're, fi we're fighting a serious corporate culture here. Yes, um, my name is Yuninsa and I am a um, clinical social worker. Mm -hmm. um, I also do, am part of a private practice, but I also do outpatient. Um, and actually, I selected this one precisely because I am currently have multiple cases um, that are dealing with this specific mm -hmm. issue and I'm mm -hmm. finding myself being challenged. Mm -hmm. So I definitely want to acquire the knowledge for it to help them as effectively as possible. Great. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm a registered mental health counselor intern. I work for the Institute for Child and Family Health. Um, and I would say, I mean, piggyback what they say, I think that this is a, I don't want to say an epidemic, but this is really going around with, I would say that out of my caseload, I probably deal with this half of them. It's an issue mm -hmm. of body mm -hmm. acceptance in boys and girls. Mm -hmm. so. Great. Well, not great that that's happening, but that's no, a good reason for being here. <laughs> my name is Mari. I'm a, a school psychologist in Miami-Dade County Public Schools, and I'm assigned to two high schools this year. So um, this one just called my attention because it is something that I see a lot in mm -hmm. each group. Great. Okay. Um, Hi, I'm Danny. I'm a student in the counseling program at FAU mm -hmm. here with the crew. <laughs> oh, that's the crew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I chose this talk because honestly it just it's not something that I mean I hear about mm -hmm. it but I've never actually like you know heard anyone like really mm -hmm. talk about it like in depth and it's you know it's relevant kind of to what it is mm -hmm. that I want to do in the future because I want to work with adolescents with anxiety mm -hmm. this is a great source of anxiety. Yep about. absolutely and in case let me just sort of reassure you well we have two men in the room here uh -huh. okay so um, congratulations on being like you know willing to do this. Um, you know, I mentioned um, Alan Duffy, who um, headed up Body Project Canada. So Alan is like probably the best trainer we have globally. Um, and nobody loves the Body Project more than Alan. Um, Alan is fantastic at this. So if you think you can't do this because you're a guy and this is all going to focus on women, like, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm Catherine. I'm a psychologist. I have a private practice and I work with a lot of young kids, teens, males, females, a lot of college athletes that struggle with body image. So I treat eating disorders, but I'm always looking for new ideas. <laughs> You're up. Hi, my name is Becky, and I'm in the counseling program at FIU. Um, I picked this one specifically because it's something that I'm interested in working with. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I work with children, so I haven't been able to dabble in this, but in the future, I would like to work with this, so I chose it because I'm interested in it. Hi, I'm Monica. I'm also in the counseling program. And this whole table's in the counseling program, yeah. right? Okay. We'll just we'll assume everybody at the table's from the counseling program. <laughs> so that you're going to actually run through them and talk through some of the activities together. And then we'll come back as a bigger group and talk through like what your experiences were. And the idea is for you to get some experiential hands-on um, time with some of the activities, which I think are really good activities. A um, couple other po things that 
um, I think are important to mention. Um, so the body project, interestingly, although Eric is not a licensed psychologist, he's, he's a psychologist, but he's not a licensed psychologist, um, and doesn't see patients, and I think probably saw as few patients as he could get away with when he was doing his doctoral degree. Um, actually, this intervention came in part out of work that he was doing with someone with anorexia nervosa. So he was working with someone with anorexia nervosa, and if, I, if I'm, I'm guessing here, at one point was probably getting a little frustrated knowing him, and um, decided to switch roles and said, you know what, I'm going to be the person with anorexia nervosa and you're going to be the therapist. And you're going to talk to me about why I should not have anorexia nervosa. And just basically flipped roles. And that was sort of some of the inspiration for the body project. So to sort of take it back into clinical um, spheres is I don't think is at all weird. The other thing that I hope you all are going to get is a little bit of personal reflection um, on body image. Um, I've done uh, things like this with a lot of different groups of clinicians and people in training. And one of the things that inevitably comes up is you, you may experience some cognitive dissonance here in this room. Um, you may come face to face with some of your own internalized attitudes about body shape and weight. And those of us who work with the Body Project on a regular basis think that's a really good thing. Um, I um, just turned 50, and I think I'm a whole lot happier um, and more accepting of myself at 50 than I would have been. Um, and we've actually had a bunch of friends recently turn 50, and my husband likes to joke that all of our male friends are like really upset that they're 50, and he's like, yeah, my wife's fine. Um, so, uh, so, you know, and I, but I think, you know, those of us who work with the Body Project regularly feel like we have a duty to walk the walk. And the Body Project works when people walk the walk. That's what we tell facilitators. That's what we tell trainers. We're like, you are to live and breathe this. And that is how we change the world. We change the world by getting millions of people to learn to walk the walk. All right, so um, theoretical basis of the body project. Um, if you are running this intervention, you have one job and one job only. This is like the prototypical opposite intervention of DBT. So for those of you who are doing DBT, like DBT's here, and there's like, tons of like complexity and you know people talk about it being like improvisational jazz and all this thing then you have the body project over here it's completely different one job and one job only your job is to set up set the stage so that people voluntarily so that's huge voluntarily dissonance doesn't work if you um, force people to do this so they voluntarily speak and act against the appearance ideals in our culture. So voluntary. You can't lecture this stuff. You can't tell them this. You have them engage in the activities, so they voluntarily um, speak and act against it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the thin ideal language has more recently changed the appearance ideal because I dealt with the thin ideal language for years and years and years. You may find me stumbling across that at times, but we're really trying to work with the appearance ideal. Um, the other thing that I think is important to realize when you go into this, um, so we live in a, as I mentioned earlier, an incredibly weight stigmatizing culture. We live in a world where we say thin is good and fat is bad. Thin is healthy, fat is unhealthy. Thin is disciplined, fat is undisciplined. Now, none of that's true, but that's the world we live in. So what will happen when you have people do body project activities at times is they will say, no, 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 but you see, it's bad to be fat. Are you telling me you want me to be obese? So one of the other constructs that's really important when you do the body project or use body project activities is to have in your, your mind the difference between the appearance ideal, which we're going to sketch out in a moment, what is the difference between the appearance ideal and the healthy ideal? And so the healthy ideal, and this is how I like to define the healthy ideal. The healthy ideal is however your unique body turns out when you are doing all of the things necessary to appropriately and simultaneously maximize your physical health, your mental health, and your quality of life. So because I'm from San Antonio, I'm going to give you the San Antonio example. Um, I've lived in San Antonio long enough to claim San Antonio as my home city. So San Antonio, we are, and I realize those of you in Florida may like want to compete with this a little bit, but San Antonio is the land of taquerias. 
okay? <laughs> we are number, like, we were one of the first cities in the country to go minority white. We are a majority Hispanic uh, city. 67% of San Antonio is Latino, and most of that is Mexican, okay? So walking distance from my house, I can walk within 20 minutes to 10 different taquerias. Okay? Huh? Yeah, I know, and they're good. Okay? Now, I personally am a huge fan of chorizo and egg breakfast tacos. Okay? Never had a breakfast taco until I got to San Antonio. Like, I think chorizo and egg breakfast tacos are, like, the best. Um, now, given my druthers, I would have chorizo and egg breakfast tacos for breakfast every single morning. Um, and, I mean, I'll be walking my dogs, and I can smell them. <laughs> like, this is how many taquerias are around me. Um, if I had my druthers, that's what I would have for breakfast every morning. But I have to be honest, chorizo is not the healthiest thing in the world. Um, and chorizo and egg breakfast tacos are really not the healthiest breakfast in the world. Now, if I want to maximize my physical health as high as possible, and that is my only concern, I will never eat another chorizo and egg breakfast taco again. So if my number one concern is to maximize my health, physical health, because, I mean, really, chorizo, not so healthy. Um, however, what does that do to my quality of life? So bad. It's so bad. Yes, thank you. It is terrible. <laughs> because I'm walking my dogs and I can smell the tacos, okay? Terrible. Terrible for my quality of life. And when my quality of life is reduced and all I'm doing is thinking about how I'd really like to have a chorizo and egg breakfast taco, but I really can't have a chorizo and egg breakfast taco. For those of you who work with people with eating disorders, you'll know what this dialogue goes like. Not such a good dialogue, okay? When my quality of life plummets because I am depriving myself to that degree, my mental health is not optimal. My goal is to bring these three things in, in, in reasonable sync, okay? So we're going to eat some chorizo and egg breakfast tacos, even though they're not so good for me. And in doing so, my quality of life is much better. I currently eat one once a week. You know, every Saturday morning before I go grocery shopping, we go buy one of our taquerias, and I have my chorizo and egg breakfast tacos. And it's wonderful, and I enjoy it immensely, and, and I'm good, okay? So, my healthy ideal is when I'm doing that on a broader scale, okay? When I'm walking through my life and I am exercising an appropriate amount, but I'm not doing so to the intense degree. Um, it's when I think of exercise examples, and, and the reason I'm spending time on this, I really want you to have a concept of what the healthy ideal is. So I'm a Pilates junkie, I love doing that. And I remember people will say to me, they're like, well, how come you're not pounding it out like, you know, like running or things? Well, running's terrible for my knees. My knees don't like running, I don't like running. Okay? I'm physically active. I walk my dogs. It's good. All right? So the idea here is that throughout my life, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm balancing my physical health, my mental health, and my quality of life to a reasonable level. However my body turns out when I'm doing that, that's my healthy ideal. Now, my healthy ideal happens to look like this. Someone else's healthy ideal could be my height, could be 50 pounds heavier. Right. Do you find the dialogue more difficult in terms of eating habits versus physical activity, or do you find that they're equally as challenging of a dialogue? When with well, bodies? when we're doing this, we don't actually spend a lot of time dialoguing about it. Okay. We simply define this. And I'm spending a little more, I'm spending actually quite a bit more time on this with you than I would spend in, right. in a group, just because I want to make sure that you really understand this concept. Because when someone comes back to you and says, oh, you're saying it's okay to just eat burgers and not exercise, we go, no, 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 we're saying it's okay to accept your healthy ideal. And different healthy ideals look differently. Somebody else's healthy ideal could be the same height as me, could be 20 pounds lighter, could be 70 pounds heavier. Okay, bodies, bodies come in different shapes and size. The thing is, when I'm focusing on the behaviors necessary to be mental health, physical health, quality of life, all relatively equal, taking care of myself, but not being obsessive about it, um, that however my body turns out, that's my healthy ideal. And so that's, that's the contrast that if you get somebody stuck with. Like, can that be also a little um, far away from the healthy ideal medically? Like, if I say, oh, my healthy idea is that I'm just working out once a week, mm -hmm. eating burgers three times a week, mm -hmm. but then my medical values. Right, then your medical values are off, then we would say you'd want to tweak that to try and take care of your medical values, but that might do nothing to your weight. So you can, people can, in fact, can change behaviors and can actually change their medical status without even losing a pound. 
And even when people do lose weight as a result, it only takes 10% body weight to change medical risk factors. So if I'm 300 pounds, um, so let's imagine right now I'm 300 pounds. I lose 10% of my body weight, I'm now 270 pounds. And my blood pressure and my, like, my blood glucose and all that is actually likely to look substantially better based on those 30 pounds. Do you think as a woman in our culture that I'm much happier at 270 pounds than I was at 300? No, because I still don't meet the appearance ideal. So now I'm, now I'm healthier, but I don't feel any happier because what I really wanted was a look not health. So that's what we're contrasting here. Okay, so we're going to warm up actually with one of our um, activities. So we're going to warm up with my biggest body image pet peeve. Um, so what I would like you to do is to basically, we're going to do our little groups here, um, to identify, each of you can identify your biggest body image pet peeve with either the media or the fashion industry. Um, both obviously which can influence people's body image. So for example, someone might say that her biggest pet peeve is the way that clothing sizes for women vary so much according to brand. Or someone else might say that her pet peeve is the way that editors touch up photos in magazines so we never get to see a real person. Someone else might have a um, pet peeve about the way that phones um, on, and uh, social media apps all come with all of these filters and things so that everybody's encouraged not to show themselves as they are. All right, so just go into your group, go around the group, and everybody share a biggest body image pet peeve to get you warmed up on this topic. Okay, you're going to get about one more minute. Um, so, I mean, basically, if you're, if you're running a group with other, um, where you've got a small group of, you know, people, whether it's in a, you know, residential program or um, if you're running groups, but even you can do this one-on-one -on -one, uh, with somebody. Um, it's just a way to, in a very non-threatening way, open up the topic and, and, you know, start to discuss it. So this is one of the things we do in the body project. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do, and we're going to do this collectively as a group. I'm going to go to the board, um, and uh, we're going to basically define what the perfect woman looks like. Okay, how tall is she? Um, what do her arms and legs look like? How thin is she? Think of celebrities in the media. Think of the way that images look um, when they've been doctored. Okay, so the person you mentioned who's making all that money, um, you know, uh, doing imagery touching, like how, how are we retouching them, all right? So what does the perfect woman look like? So let's put it up here. Okay, so 5'7"? Five, 5'7". Five, 
Five seven. Okay, five seven. Smooth skin. Hairless everywhere? Okay, hairless everywhere but on the head. All right, okay, so no body hair. All right, a stomach. Flat. flat. Okay, flat. Yeah. Now, is it like a man's six pack? No. No. See, look how we know this. All right. <laughs> okay. So, I once had a student who explained to me that the name for that, for what women are supposed to have, is actually a two pack. There's like a line down the middle, but you don't have that same level of sort of ripness. Okay. All right. So, but everybody said you want flat, but not a six pack. Okay, so let's go with the boobs. Now, by the way, if you're ever running this, don't be all technical with breasts, all right? Just call them boobs. It'll make, it'll make the people in your group much happier because they'll know you can talk about body parts in the way they want to talk about body parts. So tell me about the boobs. Perky. Perky, okay. Small? Yeah, but not too big either. But not too big. Okay. So, so yeah, so we're basically talking about here, this here, we've got the breast, you know, it's a little bit like the Goldilocks situation here, right? Okay, so, boobs, perky, and big, but not too big. Okay, so yeah, let's hear it for the butt. Round, perky, lifted. Okay, so, all right. But round, perky, lifted, no cellulite. You want a thigh gap. I got no cellulite for you here, okay? Um, so, uh, arms. No. Super muscular? No. <gasps> toned. Thin but toned. Legs, in addition to the thigh gap, other details. Short or long? Long. Okay. What else? Perfect teeth. Perfect teeth, okay. What, what are perfect teeth? Straight white teeth. Um, I heard somebody say tanned. Um, but does she have any wrinkles, despite all that sun exposure? No. Tan, no wrinkles. Okay, so we could go on a little bit, but we've got the general gist here. So let's just sprawl this out. So the perfect woman is five foot seven with smooth skin, no blemishes, no body hair except for the hair on the head and the eyebrows. Um, a flat belly but no six pack. Perky boobs that are big but not too big. A round perky lifted butt with no cellulite. Long legs with a thigh gap. She's thin but toned arms. Straight white teeth. Okay. Oh, I forgot to ask, how much body fat does she have? So little body fat. So, right. So little body fat, which is interesting because she's got these big boobs that historically have been made of body fat, but I guess not anymore. Um, all right. So. We call this look, this thin, toned, busty woman with these thin but toned arms but not too muscular and all of that, what we call this is not the perfect woman, but the appearance ideal. All right. 
Um, this activity, by the way, is straight from the body project. This is, what we do, this is what we do with participants. And why do we do this? Because we need them to have this construct of the appearance ideal. So now what we've done, and you'll notice I crossed out perfect woman. We're not going to agree that this is the perfect woman. This is a construct. I don't use that term when I run the groups. We just simply say, we call this look the appearance ideal. What that does is give you language to talk with people about this. Um, without, by using, by getting away from the term perfect woman, you get away from sort of perpetually endorsing it with your language. Um, and the other part of it is it's just fun to do. <laughs> um, as you'll notice, despite the fact that we have a reasonable amount of ethnic diversity in this room, we had quite a lot of agreement on this. Um, and so one of the things that's great about doing it this way is that, um, you know, yeah, if you get some different groups, they'll sometimes say, you know, big, I didn't go into hips, but some will say a little bit bigger hips and some will want a slightly smaller hips. But there's actually a lot of universality to this. Um, and you'll even see it in other countries. Um, so, for instance, in um, some of the countries in Africa, when you look at the women who make it up through Miss Universe and things like that, they look very similar to the women who make it through here in the United States. So there's been sort of a, a, sort of a um, equalization of this where it gets promoted fairly widely. Again, there are some subtle differences, but because you let people define this as opposed to telling them what the definition is, you actually get pretty good buy-in and then you have a definition. All right. And, and by the way, if you're doing this, have fun with it. <laughs> ask, um, I'm wondering what the kind of stress level of the patients are like, or the, the, the participants, participants are like, mm -hmm. um, as this exercise is doing. This one, usually not terribly high. This is fun for people. So it tends to actually feel very much the way it felt in here, is, it, is pretty much how it feels where people will be shouting stuff out. And again, what you're looking to do, you know, when I model that, like with the boobs, like literally once you make it clear that they can talk about this in whatever language they want to talk about, stress level goes way down. If it, stress level, if they think that they're going to have to be all proper, it can go up higher. But if you make it clear, you're happy to about talk about this any way they want to talk about it. They're like, oh, cool, OK, let's go. So yeah, this is, the, the, how it felt here is exactly how it feels. All right, so um, what I have are some questions um, that I'm going to go ahead and ask you. And we're just going to do this part in a big group. Um, and then we'll go back to doing some small group activities. So um, my question, my first question for you is, has the appearance ideal that we currently have on this board, has this always been the gold standard for feminine attractiveness? No, I think mm -hmm. I saw like a, um, a, like something on Facebook or something mm -hmm. earlier, how like in different decades it's been different. So like earlier on, like the, I think it was like the 70s, it was like thin curls and like how each like decade would change it. Mm -hmm. Like now it's like some of the girls have to have like a big butt and like big hips mm -hmm. or whatever, because that's what's into, like that's what people are into now. But before, like back in the 90s, it was like, no hips, really tiny legs. Mm -hmm. So I think it like changes. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are all derivatives of the thin ideal. Um, but has it ever been even more different than that? Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking back in the day, like when Picasso used to paint mm -hmm. women, you see all the very actually uh, much larger size of women. That was the gold standard of beauty. And then if you can go back a little bit further, you can even see some of the earlier artists, all the women were bigger. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. I think Marilyn Monroe was probably when you saw that shift of now this hourglass figure. And now mm -hmm. we're sort of seeing it again with like the Kardashians. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I, you know, stigmatized anyone with that name. But, any, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, the point is, it's kind of interesting to think that before that time, um, that, was, mm -hmm. that was what beauty was, having, holding on to that extra weight. Mm -hmm. And now it's just a complete shift. Okay, there, and then there, and, and I'll come back to you later on other ones. I actually read that during the time of, like, uh, the Tudors and mm -hmm. all those families in England, that it was, like, attractive to be fat because it meant they were rich and had food. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And pale. Yeah. Because you mean you didn't mean you weren't out in the fields laboring. Uh -huh. 
And my first thought when I'm at a museum and see that is like, what is their cholesterol level? Or I get blood pressure because I'm so conditioned. Mm -hmm. It's not a healthy thought. Oh, right. So right. the first thing you look at and you think, because we spend so much time saying that that's right. right. Well, I mean, you know, honestly, many of them weren't worried about that because they were dying way sooner of diphtheria and typhoid. <laughs> Oh, just because your cholesterol levels just because you think doesn't mean your cholesterol is high. I know you're absolutely right. I mean, I have to fight that. That's more oh, my okay. thought goes. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, no. I have that awareness. Yeah. When I see it, I find that I'm so programmed. Um, yeah. Well, and no, your point is excellent. So, and 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 I, I got what you were saying, but your point's excellent. I think it's really important to remember. So, when we focus on obesity in the obesity crisis, in the so-called obesity crisis, in the so-called obesity epidemic, what we're being is lazy. All right, because obesity is correlated with negative health outcomes, but it is not perfectly correlated. So if you look at metabolic syndrome, which obesity is the lazy stand-in for, if you look at people who are, um, are, are so-called, I don't like this term, but so-called normal weight, all right? Um, you know, maybe 30% of them have metabolic syndrome. And you move to people who are overweight, maybe 50% of them have metabolic syndrome. But that means 50% of overweight people do not have metabolic syndrome. And even if you look at people who are obese, who meet the definition of obesity, 30% of them do not have metabolic syndrome. So it is correlated, but it is not perfectly correlated. We cannot look at somebody and know what their medical indicators are. The only way to know somebody's medical indicators are to run their blood levels, um, to actually check their medical indicators. So I always, the way that I now talk about it is talking about obesity is lazy. Um, we should be talking about the actual medical problems. Okay, so where does this come from then? If this has not always been there, where does this come from? What are the origins of this? Media? Who said media? Media? Okay. I think ourselves. Mm-hmm. Ourselves? What else? Parents, peers. Parents, peers. Big mm -hmm. business. Big business. I was just saying, I think Sarah Blakely is the second or third wealthiest woman, multi-billion dollar industry with Spanx. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Spanx. Spanx. Yeah, I heard they're really uncomfortable. I've never worn them. <laughs> kind of goes against being a body project person. Okay, so how is the appearance ideal promoted to us? Who or what encourages us to view this as ideal? Fashion industry, absolutely. And that's one, by the way, that is also one origin of the thin ideal. So fashion designers will, in fact, tell you it is harder to cut and sew for a body with more curves. So. They like thin models because they like human clothes hangers. Um, and so that's one origin of it, but they absolutely promote it. Who else promotes it? Hollywood. Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Who else? Diet companies. Diet companies. Cosmetics. Cosmetics. Gym franchises. Gym franchises. Magazines. Magazines. All of these different plastic surgeons. Okay, so now my question for you is, have you ever received a negative comment about your weight or shape from your friends, family, or dating partners? And how did that make you feel emotionally? How many people, just raise your hand, how many have ever heard a negative comment? All right, and how did it make you feel? Terrible, horrible, angry, annoyed. I heard sad, what else? Embarrassed. All right, so this doesn't feel good. Now, by the way, if you're doing, asking these kinds of questions with um, people, sometimes people will say, well, we should get into that question and like dig deep, like more about the details. At this point, I never do. The only point of that is for people to realize that, they're having, that this is having an impact on them and it's having a negative impact. And we don't want to push for more intense disclosure too soon. They might not be ready to talk about it in more detail. So that when people get positive mm -hmm. comments mm -hmm. and where they don't feel good about themselves, mm -hmm. it also has an emotional impact. Yeah, it can have a really negative impact. Um, 
I, uh, back when I was doing work with, um, so in, in the various incarnations on our way to 3.9 million girls with um, Dove, um, you know, at one point uh, from 2005 to 2012, I was working with the Tri Delta sorority. And I remember I was asked by um, one of their members who said to me, and this is going to come up later if we get to the challenging fat talk section, she basically said to me, well, why is it bad to say to somebody, hey, you know, that you look great, you've lost weight. She goes, if they were not healthy before, why is it such a bad thing to say that to them? And I said, well, first and foremost, going back to our earlier discussion, you have no idea whether or not they were healthy or not before unless they shared their medical information with you. And even if you, they did share that medical information with you, you have no way of knowing if you have not been with them every second of every day, you have no way of knowing about whether or not they lost the weight in a healthy way or whether they lost the weight in an unhealthy way. And I always like this example that another board member then gave me of um, her, uh, a good friend of hers who was going through a really rough time and went from eating a very healthy diet to basically not eating. She got so stressed she wasn't hungry. And then she was energizing herself with um, Diet Coke and coffee and um, picked up smoking again and lost a bunch of weight. And everybody was walking up to her going, my god, you look so great. You lost so much weight. And she didn't, hadn't felt bad about her body beforehand. But when everybody was done telling her how much better she looked when she was thin, thinner, um, she was like, well, shoot, I guess I looked terrible before. And I guess this is the way I'm supposed to look. But I don't know how to do this in a healthy way because what she was doing was actually very unhealthy. So this belief that thinner is always healthier is a problem. Um, I'm going to keep moving because I want to move on to some of the um, other activities. Okay, so what I'd like you to do um, is take a couple of moments, just like two, I'm going to give you about two minutes, and write down, you can scribble it on the back of your handouts if you want, um, write down what are the costs of pursuing the appearance ideal. All right, so I want you to take, again, I'm only going to give you about two minutes to write down every possible cost you can think of to pursuing the appearance ideal. Um, this is going to be self-esteem costs, health costs, monetary costs, relationship costs, professional academic costs, costs to our culture more broadly. It's an individual thing. Write down by yourself. Don't talk to anybody right now. about one more minute. What we're doing right now, how many sessions would that have been? First. This is all first. In the, in the actual body project, yeah. Now in the four session version, it's done as a homework assignment. In the two session version, oh, the stuff that we just did previously, that's first session. This is a homework assignment or is done in session, depending which version. OK, so let's go ahead and write down some of the individual costs. So cost to the individual. What would you come up with? Time. OK. Well, here in the, sorry? Mental energy. Mental energy, and then I heard time. Time to do what? Let's just spell this out for a moment. Relax, ice cream, or do things I enjoy. Okay, so you don't have time to do things you enjoy. Who else said time? Mm -hmm. um, what are other things that you spent? Focus on some other interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Like reading, like learning. Okay. Time so you spent on obsessive, obsessional thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so obsessional thinking. More time at the gym versus more time with a friend. Yep. And being at the gym is fine as long as you like it. Right. You know, if it's pleasurable or, you know, um, but yeah, excessive time at the gym if you're not enjoying it. So what else? What are other individual costs? Monetary. Monetary. Well, yeah, what are we spending money on? Surgery. Right. Products, surgery, cosmetics. Spanks. 
All right. Injury. Injury. Yep. Don't eat enough. Bones get thin. Mm -hmm. Malnutrition. Medical complications. And medical complications can come from the malnutrition. Medical complications can also come from unnecessary surgical procedures. Um, you know, there, there are a variety of ways. Medical complications can come from using different products. Um, I was not aware of this, but in some areas in the United States, skin lightening creams are still used. Um, and some of them are lead-based. Yeah, lead, which we should all be avoiding. Lead, it's not good for you. Um, mm -hmm. Loss of energy. Mental health. Low self-esteem. Social anxiety. Isolation. So if we were, if I was in a group and I was doing this um, with high school girls or if I was in another group, what you would want to do is you would want to get as many of these things down as possible. You want as big a list as possible. We're not going to go through all of it because I've got my eye on the clock and I want to get to some other activities. But let's just briefly talk about what are some of the societal costs? Lost potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, think about, um, you know, and all of that. Like, think about all those things we could do with all that money, with all that time. That would be more meaningful than trying to change our bodies. Oh, prejudice. Mm-hmm. Prejudice, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So what does that do to the next generation? Mm -hmm. problem, right? right. We make it transgenerational. Promotes the importance of outward appearance versus internal values. Okay. So um, Basically, if you're, if you're doing this um, with a group of individuals or if you were going to try and translate this into something on a more individual activity, what you really want to do is get as many of these things articulated and spelled out. And what's happening here is that when people do this activity, they're doing the opposite of what we do on an everyday basis when we think, if I would just do this, I could look closer to the ideal. If I could just fix my stomach, if I could just do this. You know, if I buy this product, I'll look closer. You know, when, when we're doing all of those activities on a daily basis and we're engaging in pursuit of the appearance ideal, well, when we engage in pursuit of a goal, over time that goal becomes more important. The more you invest in a goal, the more that goal becomes important. And what we're doing here is we're having people stand back and say, instead of thinking constantly about the benefits of achieving this goal, let's think about what it's costing you. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how some of these answers differ when you're working with participants versus a room full of mental health professionals. This is exactly what it looks like. Yeah, this is exactly. The only way it looks different um, is if, so if you're running in a group and you have um, what one of my students once named, and we've stuck with this name, if you have a thin idealist. So a thin idealist is a person who has deeply, deeply bought into this and is currently experiencing even more cognitive dissonance than everybody else in the room. Um, and then th those types of individuals will sometimes try to say, but there are benefits. And then you say, yeah, okay, well, you know, but society tells us there's benefits a lot, so look, right now we're just going to focus on the costs. Um, in other sections of the program, um, the, the rule of thumb within idealists, like if you're running this program in a group, the rule of thumb within idealists is you never, you as a group leader, never challenge a thin idealist. If the group leader challenges a thin idealist, 
then what will happen is participants back the thin idealist because it seems like the group leader is picking on a participant. On the other hand, if all the participants want to jump down her throat, it's fine because <laughs> then all those participants are making lots of anti-appearance ideal statements. Uh, and that's the mechanism of action. So the thing to always remember is all of these activities are designed to have people explore, you know, why it makes sense to reject it. But this is actually very much, um, you, you all are behaving exactly the way typical group members behave. So we create a collective list. So now what I'd like you to do is in your little groups, go around your groups so that each of you can provide one statement about why pursuing the appearance ideal doesn't make sense. This can be as simple as saying it's impossible to achieve or the costs are too high or whatever part of our discussion that we've had so far um, fits with why you thinking pursuing the appearance ideal versus the healthy ideal is problematic. And just go around your group and say that. Like each of you can just go around and circle. Okay, so, so what just happened? What did you all just do? Mm -hmm. But step out for a moment. What, what if, you, if you step away from like the actual like living in the experience and you step out and you reflect on what you all did, just did, what, what did we just all have you do? Reject the appearance ideal. <laughs> so that, that, that's why we sort of finished with that, is after lining up all those costs, then we're like, so yeah, just let's just go around the room and just say why this doesn't make sense. Now that we've got this giant list, let's just go around the room and say why this doesn't make sense. And what the people, or what the individuals in the group are doing is they're voluntarily rejecting the appearance ideal and they're making a public statement, um, which again, if you remember dissonance theory, um, we want it to be voluntary and you experience more, you experience more dissonance when it's public. So you make a public statement about why it doesn't make sense. And because you get to pick about saying why it doesn't make sense, it's more meaningful to you. It's more genuine. We want people to make genuine statements about why pursuing this doesn't make sense. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please ask questions all along the way. In that moment, do you, do you then, like the same thing that you just did, like mm -hmm. ask us what just happened and for us to recognize it? Do yeah, you no. Do you do that? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely not. We just go, yay, they all did it, and we're going to move on. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, that was, per that was purely for you all as clinicians. Um, but yeah, good question. Yeah, that comes down to, you know, we'll sometimes get um, uh, therapists who will say to us, you know, when, if they go through the training for this program, they'll say, but I want to, like, unpack this more and I want to have like deeper conversations about it and our word is nope no the whole point is simply for them to reject it <laughs> simply rejecting it actually works pretty darn well <laughs> um, and so and produces you know effects you know three years later so we don't generally sort of then like get super deep into it it's about just having them like say yeah I reject it like yeah this this is impossible or now that I look at this cost, this seems ridiculous. I would rather do other things with my time. Great. Good. Um, I mean, maybe this is ridiculous, but it's taken me this long in my life and to come up with this. But the healthy ideal is a subjective ideal because it's about the individual. It's what's happening mm -hmm. to you. Right. And this appearance ideal is objective. Right. Everything. Yes. And so it's hard to say, like, I can, I can know subjectively what is healthy, mm -hmm. and what is a good appearance ideal that is just a, that is just a yeah I, the, the appearance ideal is is a much slippier or slip more slippery concept because there's so much variability just as there is no perfect height for people and people come in sizes from this to this people come in all different shapes and, and shapes and forms and weights and all of that um, and yet we have this very narrowly defined appearance ideal and it's making a, a, a overwhelming number of us utterly miserable to try and stuff ourselves into that box. It's making a lot of people a lot of money too. Um, but the idea is that, you know, take care of yourself and go live a nice life and like, and then get on with it. It's sort of, and that's sort of your healthy ideal. Um, you know, your healthy ideal means that, yeah, when you go to the physician, the physician's not freaking out about your blood sugar or your blood, you know, your blood pressure. But also, optimally, if we actually got the medical professionals on board with this, because they are actually a very weight stigmatizing profession, 
um, that they might recognize and instead of just looking at you and going, well, you're fat, that's the problem. I, I actually have a lot of people I know who have been told their high cholesterol was because they were overweight when in fact it's a, it's a long-standing family history situation and some people's families just run high on cholesterol. It's not going to matter what they weigh. Um, and so, yeah, it's focusing on those things that are medical indicators and then your quality of life and, no, and, and common sense things. Move. Eat reasonably well. Recognizing not everybody can afford to, but as best you can given your, your, your uh, resources. All right, so um, this is the verbal challenge task. Um, this task is a little tricky um, because it can turn into just people sort of telling sob stories, but I'm going to try and have you walk through it the way we really want people to walk through it. So I'd like you to think of a time when you felt pressured by somebody else to pursue the appearance ideal. Um, and for our men in the room, um, so pressure to pursue a culturally sanctioned body type. Um, and if you can't think of an instance when somebody else pressured you, think of a time when you pressured yourself where you looked at somebody else's body or you looked in the mirror and said, I need to do X. Um, I just had uh, one of the people in the audience um, uh, tell me that his daughter came up to him and said, you know, Daddy, you constantly talk about how you need to have a smaller stomach. You really should stop that. Okay? So that's an example of him putting pressure on himself to conform. Um, if you work out in the gym, people will make comments sometimes um, about body types. Um, but most of us have had somebody comment on our body at some point or another where you felt pressured to um, pursue a different ideal, or rather to pursue the ideal. Um, so for example, um, this one actually comes from one of my patients. Um, so she was trying on clothes, and but let's just pretend it's happening to you. So you're trying on clothes, and the salesperson asks you if you need a different size. You ask for one size larger, and she responds, that makes sense. You have something of a rump on you. By the way, I have a new diet that worked great for me if you're interested. Yeah, this is a classic moment. Um, back then, you thought I needed to lose weight. Um, actually started crying and slunk away in shame is what she did. Um, that was like her experience to that salesperson teaching her like that. And so what I want you to do now um, in this case is respond with how would you respond now to indicate that you don't agree with the thin ideal or the appearance ideal. So back then she slunk away in shame crying and thought I need to lose weight. But if you could put yourself in her shoes, what could you say to that salesperson? besides like just expletive, um, what could you say to that salesperson that would assertively indicate that you do not agree with the appearance ideal? That's okay. I don't need your help. I'll go to a store that will give me a larger size. Okay. I would put her on the spot and be like, oh, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you to comment on my body? Okay. Good. So comment out on the rudeness. What else? You can just be sarcastic and be okay. like, um, no thanks. I like my rump. Okay, no thanks, I like my rum. Mm -hmm. Where's your manager? Where's your manager? <laughs> Good. Okay, so, but when we're doing this, really, so what I want you to do is now return to your own example and think of a time when you felt pressure to pursue an appearance ideal and think that if you could go back in time, if I have a magic time machine and you can go back in time, how would you respond now given the discussions we've been having? And then go ahead and share in your groups. All right, so let's, co let's come on back. Um, so what I'm going to ask are just for a couple of volunteers um, to share uh, what that was like and just sort of to model this. Um, so like if I think about this activity for myself, um, I go back to a time in college where, um, where my college roommate came up to me one day and she goes, you know, I've been looking at your arms and I think your arms are just like, they're too big, they're too muscular. Like, you probably should work out less so that you have thinner, like, more feminine arms. Um, and at the time, I was kind of, like, really taken aback, and I was kind of uncomfortable, and I kind of wrestled with it. I mean, I didn't, like, burst into tears or anything, but I was really, like, oh, my gosh, you know, should I do this? And I know that now, if somebody said that to me, I would look at them and I'd go, I really like how strong my arms are, you know? I like that I'm not the person fumbling with my bag, you know, when I'm like traveling and putting it up in the overhead bin um, and all of that. And you know, if strength comes with some size, like I'll deal with it. Um, so, uh, so okay, let's get some other, a couple other examples. We'll take, say maybe an example or from each table. 
Mm -hmm. I'll start off. Um, it was about my hair. I cut my hair like sometime in high school. Mm -hmm. um, it was a bob cut. And um, it was my mom. She was like, oh, what did you do to me? Because mm -hmm. um, like, um, my mom associated or associates long hair with like beautiful mm -hmm. sexiness, whatever. So she said to me, oh, now how are you going to get a boyfriend? Mm -hmm. And at the time, I had a boyfriend. But well, regardless, I like I, I responded like I think I cried, and mm -hmm. um, now I just like laugh at her because it's just like it's like I, I was saying like I feel like an older generation sometimes are kind of like stuck in their ways, maybe like a little bit like most of my mom's ignorant, but like certain like you know. Now I just laugh because if I want to cut my hair, I cut my hair mm -hmm. without like, and I just kind of like blow her off now. Right. But, like back then, I like mm -hmm. I was like, oh no, what did I do? Great, thank you. I'm actually laughing at that because at one point I cut my hair like I dropped off like 17 inches. And when my mother saw me, she went, <gasps> what did you do? And I'm like, I cut my hair, get over it. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I went to the doctor after my first pregnancy to mm -hmm. get contraceptive. And I wanted the mm -hmm. something you mm -hmm. And he's like, no, you tend to go on the chubby side, so that's not going to work out for you. <laughs> Okay, back then, how'd you feel? I was like, yeah, I tend to go to a child like, so right. Right. And what would you say now? Um, I wish I could say something different, but... All right, help her out. What could she say to the doctor? <laughs> it's my body, my choice. It's my body, my choice. Yep. Amen. Mm-hmm. She should find a new doctor. Yeah. So um, I, I would prefer to have a medical professional who treats me with greater respect. So, mm -hmm. uh huh. Right. So there's another thing you can say. That's a really insensitive comment. So people think that it's okay to be really rude around people's other bodies, like really, and it's okay. One Susan, go. That's insensitive. You know, it's funny, people can dish it, but then when it comes back to them, mm -hmm. they can't take it. Mm -hmm. And I think if people thought that more, thought like that more often, mm -hmm. then we would have more respect in these doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that would, like, think before you speak. Like, if you don't want it mm -hmm. said to you, why do you think I want to hear it? Okay, so could you say that's insensitive and it's my body, my choice? Good, excellent. All right, by the way, that's what you do in a group. Um, if somebody can't come up with an answer, um, you basically you get people to help them. And then you go back to the participant because we want her to make the statement. In an individual session, would you do the same thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, I haven't done this individually, but I think the exercises are good clinical exercises. All right, anybody else? Have one you'd like to share? Mm -hmm. um, I fell into the uh, sweat for your wedding. Mm -hmm. I put that pressure 100 percent on myself. Mm -hmm. And um, wedding dresses, I guess, come bigger than other clothes. Mm -hmm. So I had them put it as tight as possible, and then I lost the weight to get into that dress. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could go back now to your wedding, what would you do? I would wear a dress that I could sit down in. <laughs> <laughs> I stood all night. Um, uh huh. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's exactly what that's exactly what this activity is about. It's about, um, and again, in doing this, going back to the um, going back to the goal of this intervention, what you're doing when you say those things is you just made a lovely statement against the appearance ideal. You basically just said, "I would like to enjoy my wedding instead of pursuing the appearance ideal." Um, and in, in your case, you rejected what the doctor said, but you also got some wonderful affirmation from the person next to you. Um, and we're learning from each other. Um, so let me just stop here for a minute and get any, any questions, thoughts, reflections. All right, we'll keep going. Actually, I have a question. Sure. Really quick. Now that I'm thinking about it, like, let's say, like, someone has a bad self-esteem, mm -hmm. body satisfaction, but it originates from, like, family or peers. Mm -hmm. Do you bring in that family or peer, peers 
doing that, like who are causing that mm -hmm. satisfaction? No. no, we're teaching them how to respond to it. So what's interesting is embedded in this intervention is also some good old fashioned assertiveness training. Mm -hmm. um, so there, I would hmm? argue that when you're working with a middle schooler and the mm -hmm. parent's doing it, that, that it needs to be both ends. That well, quite possibly. Mm -hmm. College kids and high schoolers, yeah. So, empowering that kid to be able to assert that to their own parents and then recognizing that they can have a little more control. Absolutely, but if you prep the parent, then they're going to have a little more success when they're assertive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. if the parents ingrained in that thought. Sometimes we throw. Them. And and I think you I think you'd have to be so um, you know I. If you're working in that age group, like just to be really honest about, there, there's no, I don't know anybody. I mean, I, I suspect, given how widely disseminated the body project is at this point, that there are people using the exercises in clinical practice in ages like that. How, exactly how they're doing it, I've never done that. So I can't tell you exactly how to do it. I would say that if you have a parent who is an idealist, um, then they're gonna have a hard time, you know, and so you're gonna, you're gonna look for other strategies potentially. Um, but I will say that I've had, what I might do though for a group like that, for someone in that situation, um, would be to try and figure out a way to get that middle schooler, um, to get a free being me group going up around and get that middle schooler in that group. Um, so one of the things that, and granted this is college students, but I've had a lot of college students who will say that, you know, my mom has like huge body image issues and when I'm in that environment it feels really toxic but I come back here around my peers and I've gone through the body project, I go through the groups and it, it, it helps me sort of withstand that. So recognizing that they may not be able to change their parents but they can have these dialogues with their peers and then that gives them some robustness against those measures, those method, like those messages. So that's a sort of another way. If you've got, if you've got a parent who really is an idealist, because shifting idealists are hard. Mm -hmm. And just to add, I think with this age group, like if we're thinking like the middle schoolers, although I understand like the importance mm -hmm. of having that psychoeducation piece with the parents, I think it's also really important that like as clinicians, we validate these child's feelings. And I find that sometimes parents can backpedal that validation. Mm -hmm. We've like taught them these skills of being powerful and being assertive. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if we try to bring them in and try to incorporate them at that piece, it's kind of like, nope, sorry, I'm going to invalidate your environment mm -hmm. now. So I think there's merit to teaching mm -hmm. them those skills so that they can use them as their own mm -hmm. toolbox. And I know that a lot of people, and, and again, I think, the, I think these tools can be used individually, but I will also say that I think to the degree that even whether it's as clinicians or things that you can do this in a group setting where they can have other people to talk to is really, I mean, if we hear consistently the one qualitative piece of feedback that we get regularly is that girls, girls included, I mean, the reason that WAGS has delivered this to 3.9 million girls around the globe is not because they intended to, it's because it went viral, because the girls say that they wanna sit with other girls and have these conversations. Um, and I think that's a powerful message um, to hear so that when we can create group environments for them to wrestle through this stuff with their peers, I think that can be really powerful. So would it be cool if all that group's going on, you have parents doing the same work? Oh yeah, no, I would absolutely agree with that. And we're trying to get that piece developed. Uh -huh. um, so as I mentioned earlier, Lisa Capella is doing um, adult women's groups and we're sort of trying to get those. What's interesting is that the different ages run very differently um, and we're trying to sort of be like evidence-based along the way but certainly you can run the body project with older women and things. Um, what we find is with older women is um, that there's a big aging piece that's not directly addressed. Um, so what we don't talk about when we talk with younger, when we talk with you know college women on down, we don't talk about the fact that the thin, the appearance ideal is a young ideal. Um, that you're never supposed to age. Um, and so as women age, the aging piece can sometimes be sort of more what they're wrestling with. Um, and it's certainly the National Eating Disorders Association has said they want to fund research for mother-daughter groups, for parent stuff, but we, we don't have the research yet. All right, um, next activity. Okay, so this is probably gonna be the most fun activity of the day and the most challenging one too. All right. This is your negative body talk list. Okay, so this is the negative body talk list. Um, take a, just take a moment, a quick moment to read it. 
All right, so how do the statements on this list um, keep the appearance ideal going? How do the statements on this list promote, keep the, keep the appearance ideal going? You know, it shows that you're not satisfied with what you are, and you're, you're going to change. So mm -hmm. yeah, if you are, and you're worried that when you look your body, you're, you're getting a message that it's not good enough, and so you're going to strive to lose weight. Okay, great. You're either the one comparing or being compared to mm -hmm. others. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anybody else? All right, so, um, and so you're just going to see the questions are like right up here. Does a comment have to be negative to promote the appearance ideal? No. Okay, good. And what could you say to stop this sort of talk, or how can you change the subject? Not focus on their appearance. Okay, so not focus on the appearance. What else? Give them a positive affirmation. Mm hmm. Great, so give them a positive affirmation. What is promoting acceptance? Mm hmm. Promoting acceptance. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I want every table, to, every table needs to have a group leader. So you're going to have to pick a group leader. And the group leader is going to say one of these statements to every member at the table. And your task, if it gets said to you, is to respond in a way that clearly shows you do not agree with the appearance ideal. Right, so for example, if I were the group leader, I would look, so here, watch, we'll model this. Which one should I go with? We'll just do this. I wish I could be as skinny as you. And then I'm supposed to respond in like a positive. Well, you're supposed to respond in a way that shows you do not agree with the appearance ideal. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of like, I don't know how I would answer to that. Um, Okay, so help her out. How would you, what would be a response to that? You look beautiful the way you are. Okay, so that's one possible way. What would be another way? Comparison is the thief of joy. Okay, comparison is the thief of joy. What else? <laughs> Who says thin is ideal? <laughs> Who says thin is ideal? Different bodies are meant to be different sizes. All right? So, you're going to have one person who's the group leader, and then that person is going to go and say mean things to each of you. Okay? And you are going to respond in ways to indicate you do not agree with the appearance ideal. Once you've gone around, um, particularly for the smaller tables, then make sure you switch so that, like, if you were the group leader and you said mean things to them, then you could say mean things to her and just sort of keep practicing the different statements until we, okay? Have fun. Okay, so let's go ahead and come on back. So, uh, what was that like? It was cool. It was slightly difficult. Okay, so it was cool, but it was also difficult. What was difficult about it? Mm -hmm. It felt like you were damned if you do, damned if you don't. Okay, how so? Getting yourself into some holes. But if you don't really address it, then does that mean that it's true or that you agree with it? Uh huh. So we struggled to challenge. A lot. Okay. So there was some struggle. This isn't actually that easy. So this, by the way, is a big component of the body project. So um, depending on the manual, depends on how. Um, so different manuals, we, we've done it slightly differently. All of them include this activity. And then they include another round of this with other statements. Um, and then some of them all, then we also have some more intensive role plays. But the idea is that you literally practice um, saying this so that when you're out in the real world, you've got a chance of really, you know, doing this. So um, I want to hear more about subjectively what it was like, and then we're going we're gonna to actually talk about the items that were particularly difficult, and we're going to come up with some answers for all of those. Because after today, I hope that when you walk through your lives and people uh, negative body talk to you, you will now be part of the group that can challenge that. So I saw a hand up over here. Um, I think it's easier to challenge the ones that are directed towards someone else mm -hmm. than most of the ones that are directed towards yourself. Mm -hmm. So the ones that, well, I guess we'll go into that right. one. But the ones that, yeah, the ones that are directed, you can sort of say, don't be mean, and yeah. those types of things. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a fine line between um, 
coming out as defensive mm -hmm. and rude, mm -hmm. like to counteract a rude comment, mm -hmm. then and to be um, so like speaking against the the thing. I right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And different people are going to have different styles in how they do this. Some people prefer to be more forceful, and some people prefer a different style. So it's not that we're saying everybody has to assume the same style in doing this. Nonetheless, people make these statements. I mean, do these statements resonate? Do they seem like statements that get said? Yeah. yeah. OK. I think just finding variety in what you're saying. Because mm -hmm. there were some statements, and we'll get into it, where there were similarities. And I just trying to change what you mm -hmm. say with it being as genuine as it was when mm -hmm. you said it earlier. That, okay. That I found challenging. Mm -hmm. What else? Mm -hmm. um, so in cognitive therapy and reframing, mm -hmm. to come up with different words, they're not natural and integrated. So, you know, having to actually write it down to be able to mm -hmm. get someone to mm -hmm. say the words, I think practicing to mm -hmm. actually say these words yep. out loud is very, very hard. Right. And that's one of the reasons we do it a lot. So like when we're running, when we're running this, let's just say we're running the, like the regular body project, we, have, we do several rounds of this and when we do it, we go around the group multiple times. So there's lots of opportunity to practice. And it, it serves, I think, really a dual purpose. Number one is when you're doing it, you're rejecting the, the appearance ideal, which of course is the core intervention here. But the other part is you're actually practicing for when you go out in real life because optimally we want um, participants to go do these things with other people and not just do it in the group. Um, and we do hear from lots of people that they do, that they take this forward, that they talk to their roommates, that they talk to their friends, that they really go out and try and carry it forward. And I suspect that those participants who do that or those people who really do carry it forward are the ones that see the most benefit, um, that you, you see the most benefit from like walking this. Other things that were tough about it or just, or comments. Just general comments. I think it's very helpful to be in this position because mm -hmm. then you can identify and reflect with someone else. Mm -hmm. And so when if you have that client in front of you and they're they're the ones that's being said mm -hmm. to you and they have to challenge it, you know what it was like for you and mm -hmm. so maybe you'll learn to be more pathetic mm -hmm. if they are not so because I have a tendency, my personality is a little I can be assertively aggressive mm -hmm. where if you're rude, I'm gonna call you out on it mm -hmm. and not shy away from mm -hmm. it. But if someone is more passive and mm -hmm. not as mm -hmm. open, they're going to struggle with standing up to somebody mm -hmm. who's rude. Like mm -hmm. if that was me in the, the, um, the, the waiting room or you know, the right. waiting room, I would have walked out and like, who, who asked you for your opinion? Mm -hmm. like, I asked you for another size, give me my size or get out, like for real. But, you know, and, but just kind of having the understanding mm -hmm. that not everybody is me and mm -hmm. to be empathetic and say, well, this isn't easy for us as clinicians. Mm -hmm. How much more difficult is it going to be for our clients who mm -hmm. are not trained, who don't right. have the capacity? Yeah. And these could be people who they're really close to, like their best friend or mm -hmm. their mom. Exactly. And, and, you know, you can kind of sever a relationship. Like if you speak against your mm -hmm. parent who mm -hmm. says this, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so I just think I appreciate it having the opportunity to do this activity because mm -hmm. it helps us to connect on a different level with the client. I, I do, and I do it for exactly that reason, and then, but I also do it because I just think it's good for all of us to like practice doing this because I'm trying to build an army <laughs> of people. Like if we really want to change how things are out there, then we have to have lots and lots of people basically trying to say, hey, like, this isn't cool. We don't need to do this. Mm -hmm. I like that you do it with a group because then the idea is generated for the comeback. So the mm -hmm. challenge are from same age peers. Mm -hmm. And so like in a one-on-one -on -one session, I help kids generate, but I try not to give them what to say. Right. Because my 48-year-old version may not work in that mm -hmm. holder. Right. So then I send them on field studies to observe and report back to me how they mm -hmm. help people handle it. Yep. And then they're a little better at mm -hmm. the stuff than what. Right. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would absolutely. And then the other way is just to try and really ask them Socratic questions to get them to the point where they find a way that, to say it that, makes, that seems genuine to themselves. Um, and sometimes one strategy, you know, when people are stuck, you know, one, particularly if it's one that's directed to you, you can say, well, what would you say, like, who's, who's like a friend that you feel really protective of or somebody you feel protective of? And you say, what would you say if somebody said that to that person? 
Like, how would you respond? And sometimes people can't, who can't generate ideas for themselves can generate ideas for somebody else. And you go, okay, so let's practice saying that for you. Let's protect you. All right, so which ones were tough? <laughs> I saw somebody said all of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think the ones that are compliments are like kind of tough. Okay. Because like, oh, I wish, because if you're saying to me like, oh, I wish you could, I can be as skinny as you, you're like, like the first thing you think of like, oh, really? You think I'm skinny? <laughs> <laughs> like, come back at, right. like, you know, like, oh, wait, no, like, you're gorgeous. That, mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like you have to like stop your thinking. Mm -hmm. it's automatic. Oh, she just like complimented me. I have to say thank you. Mm -hmm. like, no, like, don't say thank you because they just said something bad about themselves. Right. Okay, and what's interesting too is that one of the final activities of um, the body project is to have people say thank you when they're given compliments, but we do this activity first so they can learn which compliments they should be saying thank you to and which ones are actually negative body talk. So it's like, say thank you to all the non-negative body talk compliments, but you know, let's challenge those. So all right, let's re read that question, read that statement, the one that you just picked. I wish I could... All right, so what, how, what are, let's come up with a variety of responses to that. Mm -hmm. I feel like it can be so complicated because when you give a compliment, like a lot of the times you're fishing for one back. Mm -hmm. So how do you respond without mentioning mm -hmm. their appearance? Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do? You, you look you great. Look, you look great. Everybody's different. You okay. You look great. Everybody's different. Sorry? I wish I could be you. Okay. I wish I could be you. What else? Other ideas. Brainstorming time. So how do you, I guess, one of the thoughts that I was having is I was trying to come up with another one was mm -hmm. trying not to phrase it as you should. Mm -hmm. Like you should or you shouldn't think that about yourself, mm -hmm. or is that still imposing your own mm -hmm. like, values or views on someone else? Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing that you can, I mean, I'm just throwing, I mean, there's a variety of things that you can do in here. Um, one thing that you can do in a situation like this is take a somewhat educational stance. Say, so you know what? Uh, say, um, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, the way that you meant that. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do these days is not compare myself to other people and just appreciate all of our individual values. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, and again, you can, you can, if you're worried about, you know, sort of that, you can, you can own that. And you say, you know, I've been trying to really focus on the idea that appearance is sort of superficial. And, you know, what I really appreciate um, about you, and then comment about some internal characteristic. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm kind of like, I think this affirmation is tricky, and I feel like part of the reason why is because I feel like some people more often than not interpret it as like them trying to like avoid mm -hmm. body stuff because they are aware of how self-conscious you are. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, you're so skinny, and like, girl, you look great, and it's like, she's just saying that to make you feel better. Right. Like, really, like, mm -hmm. It's like, how do you, how do you work with that? Right. So, uh, so one way to work with that again is to go down the educational route. You know, so um, you know, we'll say, well, we, when I've worked with participants, say, well, you know, what do you think? You know, we, we've had this discussion. What do you think the harm of negative body talk is? And then people will say, well, it doesn't make you feel good and all of this. You say, do you think your friend knows that? No, I don't think they know that. Okay, well, what if, what, what if you responded by telling them? Um, so you know, so you can come back with, you know, if somebody says, you know. Um, said to me, um, I wish I could be as skinny as you, well, particularly given that most of my friends know that like, I'm a body image person, which is like, you know, they're like, oh, God. Um, but basically, you know, I'll come back and say, okay, so, um, you know, negative body talk doesn't make anybody feel good, so um, let's talk about something else. I've, they're, they're, I'm really interested in, like, how your week went. Can that be perceived as rejection? It can be a little bit. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, if you want to end a behavioral pattern, sometimes you do have to be a little bit rejecting. Because you are, whether you're, you're not necessarily rejecting the person, but you are rejecting what they're doing. And that's okay. I, I could see that coming back and being like, well, why, why are you being so defensive? Or why are you saying that I was yeah. just trying to give you a compliment? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, the way that this, this mm -hmm. is like an internal, like, no place for hate, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, and mm -hmm. all the dissemination of, you know, not talking about stereotype groups mm -hmm. and bullying mm -hmm. and all of that, which is more external. This right. is an internal no place for hate. Mm -hmm. And some people are going to have an easier time with this because they're going to be more like you and be like, I'm okay with that person being kind of irritated at me. I'm okay with drawing a line in the sand. Um, and, you know, I would argue around this topic. I think that's, that's perfectly okay. Um, mm -hmm. What do you do? Because it's I'm obviously, uh, I know my size. Mm -hmm. but, you know, some people are not my size. Mm -hmm. You're skinny, so you don't have anything to complain about. So if, right. if, if someone who is mm -hmm. of size says something like, I can't address it, well, they would discredit what I'm having to say mm -hmm. because I'm skinny. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what it's like to be there. Mm -hmm. like, how, how, how would you respond to that? Because that's what's happening. Right. Um, I, I would, I would on, the, on a response like that, I would, I would genuinely validate that they've probably experienced weight stigma that I have not. So I might say, well, you know, I mean, you're right, you know, our society treats people who are bigger worse. Um, and so, you know, I, I realize that, you know, when it comes to those types of things, yeah, it's probably, it is more painful to be you. I, I wish I, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I get that. Where, yeah, where people are understand. like, you don't understand what it's like. Like, I, I try so hard to put on weight and I can't put on weight. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. You see it on both ends. It's mm -hmm. not just like the. Right. Yeah, for really, really thin people. Mm -hmm. and, and then again, you can always come back to, well, so you know the you know the societal the societal standards that we have for appearance like they just like they make all of us miserable. So how about we talk about something else? And that actually you know I'd really like to talk about something else. Or I've made a personal pact not to engage in negative body talk. I've made a personal pact not to engage in body talk. Period. Yeah, you I mean like not giving compliments. Uh, so yeah, right. So um, so the so the compliments. No, it doesn't mean not giving compliments. There are lots of things you can compliment people on besides their bodies. Um, so first of all, you can give them lots of compliments, and people will say to me, "Does that mean you can't give any appearance compliments?" Give people appearance compliments over things they have control over. That's not size. Um, that's a haircut that you decided to get. That's a style. Um, you have control over, you know, if somebody, if you look at somebody, instead of thinking like, instead of making comments like, oh, I wish I had your body, be like, I really love the way you put that jacket together with those pants. You got a great sense of style. Love it. Um, you know, compliment people on things they have, they have control over. Preferably, though, why don't you compliment on things beyond appearance? Like my first, you know, really, like why, why do we find the need to compliment appearance so much? And particularly if you're thinking with younger, you know, one of the things I try to do with younger girls is not go up to them and go, oh my gosh, you're so pretty. How do you, so how would you handle that if you have a daughter who people are constantly saying that to? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you say? Like, don't tell, don't, please don't say that to my daughter. So I, so, so model, actually, I like, I got this one, I'm actually from, um, so a colleague of mine lived, so in San Antonio, I know this is really going to go against Miami, but you know, San Antonio, San Antonio Spurs. Okay, really nice guys. Everyone I know who ever lived next to one of them says they are great, great people. So one of my friends was living, lived next to one of the San Antonio Spurs, and daughter came up, and apparently she is absolutely adorable, and she said, she goes, oh my gosh, you know, she, she's absolutely beautiful. And he just looked at her, and he said, what's more important is how beautiful she is on the inside. Yeah. Redirect it back. You know, my, my sister actually, partly because I think she's my sister and has to listen to this stuff all the time. Um, you know, she, as she's been raising her two daughters, she's like, yes, she goes, like, I'll get all these things like, they want to be Spider-Man, I'm so excited. <laughs> like, and, you know, she goes, I got Harry Potter and Spider-Man for two daughters. And she's like thrilled. But her big thing is, you know, when people will make comments about that, um, you know, she'll say, well, you know, if they say, oh, she's so pretty, she'll go, well, she's got a great sense of style. I really appreciate, you know, my little fashionista. Um, or she'll make a comment, say, you know, about how smart she is or things like that. And again, just as a parent, I think redirecting to show that your values aren't, you know, 
And so what, they, what they're hearing from their parents is this is more, this is more important. Hmm? You haven't answered everything. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> All right, any other thoughts or comments on this? Mm -hmm. um, I had heard that it, uh, number 15, yep. number two, back to wear a swimsuit. Yep. Um, that one pretty much has become like my inner voice. Because mm -hmm. all my lifetime I've worn a one piece. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like if I know better not to wear a two piece. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know how I wish. Okay, so all right. So do you want to change that to I'm too fat to wear a two piece? What you, which one do you want to challenge? I'm too fat to wear a swimsuit or I'm too fat to wear a two-piece? I'm too fat to wear a two-piece. All right, let's go. No, this is a really good one. I have answers to this one, but I want to see if I can get the answers from other people first. Says who? <laughs> yeah, they probably say you rock a two-piece. <laughs> Any, anybody can wear a two-piece. They make two-pieces in all sizes these days. Um, and there are, and there are, and what matters, what matters is making sure that you buy the two-piece that fits your body instead of trying to make your body fit the two-piece. Just wear anything that You can wear anything that you want to wear. You can go naked. <laughs> But I've had students on, on ones like that too. I've had people, I've had students make comments like, I'm too, I'm too fat to wear a swimsuit. Um, I've had some students come up with some really like creative things and they're like, I don't think God ever created a swimsuit police. <laughs> they're like, if that's how your body was made, I think that's how it should go in the swimsuit. And do, I mean, you were the one who said, like, do those experiments. Mm -hmm. Like, go out and see what it feels like. Absolutely, yeah. So in the last five minutes that we have, because we're pretty much out of time, what I want to do is um, just go ahead and foreshadow a couple of, a couple of other core activities um, that we do. Um, so number one, uh, the behavioral challenge. So we have participants identify things that they don't do because of body image concerns. I gave you the examples, not wearing shorts, not wearing a swimsuit, by the way, is a really classic one, um, not wearing a two-piece, um, not wearing short sleeves, um, straightening hair because it makes somebody feel like they look thinner, never going out without makeup. Um, when I do this training, by the way, if I do the training, a two-day training, I purposely wear makeup one day and I don't wear makeup the other day. Um, so they can see, because people will say, well, does this mean you can never wear makeup? I say, no, as long as it's a choice and, you're, and you feel comfortable going out without it, then it's fine. But if you, um, but if you feel really uncomfortable, then go out without makeup. Um, so basically, they identify things that they um, don't do or do because of body image concerns, and then we assign them to go do that. But you're looking for something manageable. If you have somebody who hasn't worn a swimsuit in like a decade, chances are they're not going to feel comfortable wearing like a micro bikini. So like let's start with a regular swimsuit and then work the way to the bikini if that's what they want to do. Um, another activity, the, the two that I want to send you home with, um, I definitely want to encourage all of you to do the mirror exercise. The mirror exercise. So this is where you're going to stand in front of a mirror, a full length mirror, preferably wearing no clothes, like naked. Um, but if you are uncomf too uncomfortable to stand in front of the mirror naked, then as little clothing as you are willing to wear in front of the mirror. And you are going to write down only positive things about yourself. And that should include both physical and emotional characteristics. So it could be things like, I like, you know, um, I like my sense of humor, or I like that I'm a really persistent person, would be sort of on the emotional side. But you must have some physical things. And I encourage you to pick physical things both from a functional and an appearance basis. So functional, stand there, you know, I love that my arms are really strong. Appearance, I like the shape of my butt. All right? So, and, and so those types of things. When we run this in, um, 
as an intervention in a group, when people have done this homework, they come back and we go around the circle and in front of everybody they say, I like what they like, something that they like about themselves. And um, what will happen is um, some people will say something physical, some people will say something emotional. Um, but then we go back around again, and if you said an emotional thing one time, then you've got to say a physical thing. Um, when we run it with peer leaders, because they're modeling the behavior, I always encourage my peer leaders, I'm like, look, don't say you like your eyes, because if you say you like your eyes, everybody's going to go like, I, I like my eyes, my nose, my toes. Um, <laughs> because those are easy. And I want them, there's nothing like watching a group of women suddenly be like, I like my butt, I like my hips, I like my boobs, I like my arms, like, I like my stomach. It's um, a very different thing. So that's sort of another um, cool thing that you can sometimes get going in groups. Um, and then the other assignment is to write a letter to somebody younger than you, encouraging that person not to pursue the appearance ideal. Um, and also a really powerful. I also encourage you to do the exposure um, assignment as well. Um. So here's with eating disorders. Um, get the eating behaviors under control. So if you go back to traditional CBT for you know eating disorders, you get the eating behaviors under control first, and then you do the body image piece. So body image comes later in intervention. What's interesting is we've had a lot of participants go through this who were recovered slash semi-recovered. Um, so they're not actively vomiting, they're not actively binging or a whole lot. And what they generally say is it's phenomenally helpful. They, no, they don't share that in the group, so it's I'm private. Like food right, no, they're not seriously restricting. Um, but they, um, what a lot of them have said is that this, one of them, I love the way she phrased this, she goes, I, thanks to the body project, finally chopped off the head of the vampire and buried that dust. Um, and so that basically, I think for people who are on that later stage, it can be, it can be really helpful for the body image piece. Um, but you want to get those behaviors under control first. Um, actually, uh, Project HEAL, um, which is uh, you know, a recovery uh, movement, um, they, they encourage their um, chapters to use the body project. We have like one or two minutes, so I want to stop and just take any final questions that you might have. Thank you. You said you were going to focus on other things. What are you focusing on next? Oh, um, I'm now working with a qualitative um, a uh, social scientist who um, does ethnography in marginalized populations, and we're studying psychopathology in food insecure populations. Wow. So yeah, 180 degrees. Wow. Mm -hmm. food yeah, food, yeah, but basically people who don't have enough to eat, and we're, we're, we're yeah, partnering. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we started in San Antonio. So San Antonio is very income stratified, so we have a lot of people who are really impoverished. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm now focusing on research wise like I'll still be involved with the body project but you know I've been I've been like up to my neck in this now for you know since you know the early 2000s so time to huh time to do some other things too but y'all yeah, stay involved what's like the headquarters is there the body project so the body project collaborative um, is a, a social entrepreneurship company that we formed back in 2012 because we were too poor to form a nonprofit. <laughs> to be honest, um, we run it. We run it like a nonprofit. So the point of it isn't to be profitable, but officially it is a for-profit. Um, and so um, we are the informal head of the Body Project because the Body Project is freely available on the website because you can buy the Body Project from Amazon. Um, there's no official control. We just ask people to play nice and tell us what they're doing. We informally call this the Play Nice Project. So we just ask people to play nice. Um, and so, you know, researchers around the world can research it, but we tell them, look, we recommend you get training first. Um, and then it depends where you are globally. So, you know, the Body Project Collaborative is the sort of umbrella. We sort of, um, you know, t organize it. But um, like in Latin America, um, we have a partnership with Comenzar de Nuevo out of, uh, out of Monterrey, Mexico. And so if anybody contacts me for in Latin America who wants training, I say, talk to Eva Trujillo at Comenzar de Nuevo. Obviously, if somebody showed up in um, Newfoundland or Labrador that didn't know what was going on, we would direct them there. If you're in Australia, we direct you to Eating Disorders Victoria. Um, so we have different, we haven't carved off the whole globe yet, 
um, but we've carved off chunks. Um, and we're about to, huh? And then in the United States? In the United States, we're about to hand over a lot of the control to the National Eating Disorders Association. Okay. Well, yeah, we're going to give a lot of it over to NIDA. Um, just because they've got more organizational capacity than we do. This thing is much bigger than we ever intended it to be, so. And we all have day jobs. Uh-huh. Um, have you guys thought about making it um, targeted to men? Because I mean, Yeah, uh-huh. So um, Tiffany Brown was the person who developed first the gay male version, and then she has a version called More Than Muscles that um, has a pilot in it. And so, um, but it's a matter of her finding the funding and the bandwidth. And so we are, she's doing some other pilot tests with some other people. We basically make sure they can get the regular version of the body project up and running where they're at, because if you can't get the regular version up and running, it's much harder with men and boys. Like they, we did some, we did some co-ed trials at Trinity um, and they didn't go that well. Um, and like to get, to get male students trained as peer leaders was a nightmare. They don't show, you have to reschedule the training um, like compared to what it was like. And then um, we had a lot more trouble with participants showing up. Um, we, did we didn't find it terribly helpful to run the groups mixed gender. Um, but even running them individually, like running, actually um, Tiffany says recruiting gay men or sexual minority males is much easier than recruiting heterosexual males. Uh, but we're trying to get we're trying to get the programs developed, but the research is just starting. Yeah, is it because like guys don't generally talk about like the physical? I think so. Yeah, I think that's some of it. And you know, the ones who did go through the group enjoyed it. Um, and actually, when we ran the groups with men and women together, they liked talking about it with women. Um, but um, the women didn't seem to benefit quite as much. So we're recommending at this point that they be kept separate, but the men's versions and the boys' versions are all in development. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you.